everything that you go through, you know, is part of the process to where you're supposed to end up. And so wherever you end up is where you're supposed to be. Sadness is the key to happiness because you know what's important to you. Crying is, is an indicator of what matters. I'm a big believer in, um, this is why I, I'm able to discuss emotion so, with such ease. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the What You're About podcast with me, Chad Abood. And this is where we unpack how leaders, entrepreneurs, and voices that you know from the social media world that are sharing their stories, how those stories came to be, what their gifts were, how they got through the harder times, the valleys, because it's not always peaks. And that's why I wanted to make this podcast is because it's what I deeply care about. Two things, seeing the greatness that's within others and helping them find the way forward. But what I also know is that we need to hear that message from multiple people. We need to see different representation. We need to hear different words. We need to hear it multiple times. And so that's why I really want to do this podcast because it allows me to have that discussion with incredible, inspiring folks that have been through the full journey and, you know, couldn't think of a more wonderful voice than what we have today. You know, Lisa, Lisa Blasser. And, you know, I want to say like, of course, we know you started out as a lawyer, but the journey has been long and exciting and continues to grow. And so within a few years of being a lawyer, you already became a law professor and a director of academic success and bar prep at Western State College of Law, which I didn't even know law professors could become law professors that quickly. So, you know, we're going to have to uncover some of those talents and gifts. You're the co-owner and managing partner of Blaster Law, also a board member of Student Impact, a nonprofit organization that supports students who otherwise could not afford college or higher education, which is, you know, such a beautiful mission, but it doesn't stop. You know, you've done studies, you've published the book on nine steps to law school success, and you use the study to create a scientifically proven study process for success. And I really want to dig into that too, because as I was just saying to you before we started, 1L for me was like one of the worst, most confusing years of my life academically and professionally. And so beyond all of that, also the founder of Law School Success Institute, and what we're going to get into today is you're launching an incredible course, the Law School Operating System, that is going to help students not only learn, but learn at their own pace, in their own time. And as we know, there's so many different ways of learning. And so I love it that you're providing all these different methods. I could keep going on and on, but we'd lose all our time together. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you. Likewise, Chad, thank you so much for having me and for that fantastic intro. I appreciate that. Oh, I mean, you built it, my friend. So let's get into it. You know, like you've pursued many angles at the same time, even in the legal industry, in the education industry, in the service industry of lifting others. And so I'm curious, like when you think back to, you know, little Lisa, when you were planning the big dreams that you were going to have, was this something that was always on your mind? Was it something that was pushed towards you? Like how, how did you think about what you wanted to be when you grew up? What was, what was this marinating in your mind? What a great question. So I always knew, Chad, that from a very young age, I woke up with incredible joy in my heart. And I realized that that was not normal from a very young age. Um, I, am a, I have three siblings, grew up in a you know, family. Um, nothing was perfect like all of us. But I always felt like I wake up and I just want to be like, I love you. I love this life. I have this light inside of me. And so I didn't know exactly how I was going to really use that um, as a child. I honestly, I didn't, but I knew that it existed and I kept seeing ways that it would come out of me. I was just exuding this, just kind of this piece that's just me and this piece that I can't really, you know, articulate uh, unless I get to see you and we we exchange and, and we connect and feel one another and, and exchange that authenticity. And so as a young child, 
I didn't know what it was, Chad, but I definitely, um, I knew there was something within me that was destined for greatness. And I still believe that I'm, I've gotten a lot more greatness coming, you know, even with everything that I feel like I've done. And so was that, was that like a confusing thing or because, you know, everyone's different. And so your friends, your siblings, your parents, they would have had different natures and out of everyone that I know, you know, like, I don't know if I've ever heard that answer before that you're just waking up with that. Love. It's, it's beautiful. Right. Like, but was it something where you were like, yeah, that's a superpower of mine. I'm going to be using that. Or were you thinking like, whoa, what's going on here? Like everyone else kind of has like a bit more off days than it seems that I do. Was it confusing or was it something that was like bringing you like, were you feeling joyful about it? Uh, the latter. I definitely just felt joy. And so um, it wasn't confusing at all. Um, it made me want to help people see the way that I saw, you know, um, when I saw struggle and when I saw, um, you know, frustration, really, um, really the gift is I have zero problem expressing emotion at any level. And so I can, that allows me to see in others the difficulty that they have in expressing that emotion or expressing their authenticity. It's just a real gift. It helps me identify and, and, and then it helps me, makes me want to support, not change anybody, but expand who they are, I guess is probably a good way of explaining it. Wow. That, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a beautiful gift. You know, and is it coming from a place of, um, like curiosity, do you think? Or is it like you just, you see the greatness in others, you want to help them, you know, reach their potential? Like, what is that service element inside of you? Do you find when you think back, maybe like your friendships or like, you know, how you were with your siblings? Like, was it the same with your siblings as it was with your friends? Um, To a certain degree, yes, I'm very different than my siblings and very similar in a lot of ways. I think, honestly, um, I think that it, it it's just something chat that exists inside and it makes me feel alive when, when someone is struggling and to just be able to say, I know why, like, let's uncover a couple of these things. It's, it's being probably ravenously curious about what makes people tick and, 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 you know, and, and just wanting to, um, just wanting to uncover these things and, and take blinders off of people so they can just really experience just like their natural state and just loving themselves more than that's anything, cool. you know, that's cool. We all can do it. We just all have so much that's been, you know, that we've gone yeah, that's, through. That's not something that from at least my experience, what I've seen is really taught. Not a lot of people have the tools to help people kind of uncover that. And that's, you know, that's something that I care about so much. And I think about kind of 10 years of therapy, couple of years of writing on LinkedIn. That's what it's really shown me is that like, you can get closer to knowing yourself. And when you get closer to knowing yourself, that's when you become more at peace. And that's when you see less competition, more collaboration, more lifting other people, more wanting to celebrate other people. And that just becomes a virtuous circle back to you. Because when you give first, and you help people discover their greatness, well, that stays with them. You know, you're now kind of a part of them and they want to give it back to you. And so when you were doing this with your friends, with your siblings at school, where was this taking you? Like, what were the early steps of what career might be? Did you have an idea or were you just kind of moving along, like getting your grades, passing your tests, and then law school came knocking at your door? Oh, no, that's definitely not what happened, Chad, at all. Um, I was forced into law school, right? So like, um, I, I really want, I went, I wanted to become a police officer. I wanted to do active police patrol on foot or in a vehicle. And I wanted to work in low income communities because I really wanted to understand how social norms impacted people's behavior in either a deviant way or in just in any way. I was specifically really curious about gangs and how people came together and created a family, even though they were doing illegal things potentially, but that family bond was what really intrigued me. And I wanted to know why that they, why they engaged and why they, why they had to, you know, join a gang. And so I wanted to go to college to, um, to study criminal justice administration, but my father said, absolutely not. Um, you, you no, you're not going to do that. Um, and so I, he, he was, he went from janitor to CEO. So he never went to college and so he, his kids were going to be in business. Um, and we were going to, you know, make our money in business with one way or another. And so I listened, capitulated, listened, 
And, um, but about two years in, I changed my major to criminal justice and I didn't tell anybody <laughs> and I just did it. Um, and that was kind of my first way of saying, you know, um, well, before that, Chad, I, my dad was, is a force. And so he's an incredible man, but oftentimes, and it can be generational, I was just told you're stupid. You're not going to amount to anything. Women aren't that smart. Um, women have a lot to prove. Women are really supposed to be wives and and supportive and and fit into the secretarial role. And that's not bad. Secretaries aren't bad. But I I told you I got that thing inside of me when I wake up that just doesn't let me you know that says what is the what is what's the li- there's no limits, Chad. So. So when I changed majors, that was kind of a pivotal thing for me saying, I'm going to stand up for something I want to do. And so then I just got three jobs to pay for college myself. Um, And I was taking 24 units to graduate in four years. And um, I did it. And I... um, I, I graduated and then I called, um, I was like, let's go, let's go FBI. Let's see. I called the FBI and they said, Hey, um, we're looking for women who speak Spanish and who have JDs. And so I was like, okay, I didn't, I wanted to start then and there, but I was like, I still have to prove what's the, what's the one thing I can do, Chad. And you know, all about this to prove the hardest thing I can do to prove that I'm smart to all these people, to the FBI, to my father, to all of these things, you know? Um, And so it was law school. That was one way to prove I was smart, that I could do it. And then I got into law school. My second semester, I was going to get kicked out. I was going, I was failing out. I was on academic probation. Why Um, was I? um, I was spinning my wheels to study. I was studying 60 hour weeks, legit, honestly. And um, it wasn't efficient or effective. I wasn't assessing what I was doing. I wasn't doing the right things that would lead to a deep understanding of the law. I was just doing all the things I thought you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, it was like a lot of action, but not a lot of progress. A lot of like movement, but not a lot of. Pro- I and I totally wow. There's like a lot to lot to unpack there on that last piece. One <laughs> L was just like such a disaster for me for many of the same reasons. You know, I think that the way that you study is so personal. The way that you learn is so personal. Like some people are auditory. Some people are visual. Some people are conversational. Some people need to be there. Some people want to read on their own. And I I saw it all happening, but I think I felt so much pressure on myself, you know, from others, but as much for myself to achieve in the beginning of law school that I didn't follow my instinct on how I needed to learn. And I tried learning how other people learn. And that was a disaster. And so, you know, my way of learning is I need to be there in person, focusing on what that person's saying, and then like either having the conversation with them or having it with myself. It's not reading 300 pages ahead of the class of something I didn't even understood before I got there. And it's not taking tons and tons and tons of notes while the person's talking because I can't absorb the information. And so after the first semester, which was by far my worst semester of law school, I never, and I'm not advocating for anyone else to do this. This is my story. I didn't buy any more books. And I didn't read. All I did was I went to every single class. I tried to, you know, Google the topics ahead of time. So I had some familiarity and I tried to engage with the discussion. And law school just went like, I realized how I learned. And so that's why I think it's like, it's so, it's so powerful that you're on this path and you're using your own journey to do it because I experienced it firsthand and it was so jarring to me. How did you, I'm curious because, you know, there was a moment after first semester when I was like, should I even do this? And I'm curious now, you know, like when you're telling your story, did you think that, whoa, you know, they're telling me I'm on probation. Should I just not do this thing? Or was the drive to prove everyone that you could do it just so strong? Uh, Certainly, certainly both of those things. So someone telling you and the dean telling you, Lisa, you're not academically qualified really to be here, which then proves, you know, the triggers of like, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, all those things. Um, But I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in, um, this is why I'm able to discuss emotion with such ease. I wore that academic probation status as a badge of honor, Chad, like, it's a great thing. Like how, if we're not able to learn from our struggle and this is, this is what, you know, a lot of content on social media is saying, right? Struggle is good. You learn. But I just felt all the feels. I was embarrassed and ashamed and frustrated, but 
um, so, <laughs> you know, okay, so cool. Like, so what's your next step? Like, what's the process to get yourself off? What are you doing? And let's assess what you're doing and let's figure this out. And if you can't figure it out, then that is a part of my history book. And great. What's going to lead me to the next step, which will ultimately lead me to greatness and what I'm supposed to do in this life anyway. So I don't care. I'll have debt from law school and that really sucks. But I mean, I'm going to figure this out. It's not, life isn't over, you know, like it's just beginning. It's still beginning at 44. I just turned 44, you know? So it's, it's great. <laughs> I have a lot to learn. Happy, and, and happy birthday to you. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, I think that that's, I think that that's an important message because I think both parts matter. The first part matters to acknowledge that the feelings are real. I yeah. think we get confused that if we acknowledge that, what we believe are negative feelings, what, you know, that box of negative feelings, which are just feelings, but we feel they're negative. I, I think the, the instinct is if we feel them, we're going to spiral. And I actually don't think that's true. That hasn't been true in my experience. When I've spiraled is when I'm not willing to acknowledge something that I feel and I'm bottling it up. Well, guess what? Like that's actual energy that needs to come out in some shape or form. And it's typically not positive. And so I think the first part that you're talking about really matters. You have to actually acknowledge what you're feeling just to acknowledge it. There doesn't need to be some answer from acknowledging it. Step one is just to know that it's real and be like, yep, that just is what makes a whole person. And that's just the range of feelings. And that's normal. Great. What that does is it allows you to put the bags down so that you can focus on like what's next. It's very difficult, I find to focus on what's next when you're carrying around a lot of bottled noise. It's like being in an airport. Do you remember when we had suitcases before they had wheels on them? Yes. And that was like, you know, 90% of history was people just carrying around really heavy bags and no one thought to put these genius wheels on it. Well, when there's a lot of noise about where your gate is and you have really heavy bags that you're dragging around, it's hard to make progress. But if you like take a moment and you're like, okay, we're a bit confused. Let's pause for a second, acknowledge it's frustrating, look at the board, figure out where we're going. Well, it's a lot easier then. And, and I think that's, you know, exactly what you're advocating for in like those two steps that you took. Does that like resonate with like how you felt at that time and, you know, how you think about it still? Absolutely. It's, it's exactly, I think oftentimes, especially in the legal profession, especially in law school, we are told not to feel. And we are told that it is bad and that if you feel something, you should just feel greatness, just feel greatness. And we don't always feel greatness because things hurt and we are carrying things from our childhood that might be true or things, uh, falsehoods that we believe are true because we've been told them so many times. And so to unpack that and when we're triggered and have a moment where we feel upset and sad and, and some people are depressed and some people it causes anxiety, all the things that we all feel, um, to just say it's happening. And then immediately to relieve that pressure, you say, I tell myself, I say, at least you're constantly working on this piece of yourself. And that's a really beautiful thing. So working on it, I'm working on it. So it's okay if I'm not perfect in how I handle it, acknowledge it, it's happening. And, and, and then, and then once that's done, give myself a deadline or, you know, I, I tend not to stew on things, Chad. Um, and I tell my students, let's give, I, I give them the space in office hours to let it out or text me, call me. I'm pretty open to my students. And then um, I want to talk to you again in a week. And in a week, I want you to really think about um, where this is coming from, why you're so upset at whatever that failure is so that you can, we can identify its genesis and determine if it's real or if it's false and get past that because then the next step is to really just kick butt and we're going to go full throttle on your definition of success, your personal specific definition of whatever success is for you. We'll create a plan. That's, that's so great. I, I think before, you know, before we move too much deeper into the, the career journey, something else that you've brought up a couple of times that I only learned much later in life um, is that you're very comfortable and you naturally, you naturally been very optimistic or in the pursuit, you have been very comfortable, like feeling all of your feelings and you've always wanted to be, um, you've been drawn to be in service of people that you feel haven't been given the same opportunities. Like these are three themes that like seem to be coming up, like ever since you were very young and the one about being willing to feel all the emotions, that was not something that I knew for a very long time. And the first time I ever remember learning it was I was in undergrad and I was in like my third year of undergrad 
And I was living with a guy who was, um, was born in Brazil and, you know, Brazil, massive country. People are all different, but I've, I've met some Brazilians, played soccer with a bunch of Brazilians. And I think at least on the male side, they are not taught to be so restrictive of their emotions. It seems to be a bit more thematic or a bit more trend that like they're expected to feel all of the things. And so I remember he was crying and we're, you know, we're on the soccer varsity soccer team and undergrad and it's kind of, you know, like uh, full on football and basketball, but fairly macho environment. And he was crying. I remember one time we're like 20 years old and I'm looking at him. He's one of our best players. I'm looking at him thinking like, when are you crying? You know? And he, and he looked at me confused and he was like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, you're crying. They're like, why? What's the big deal? And he's like, it's an emotion like laughing. And if you're not crying, then you're not feeling like the full range of life. He was so confused with my reaction. And I respected him on, on all fronts as a person, as an athlete, a dedicated human, a, a good friend. He's still a friend of mine to this day. That it actually, for the first time, made me check myself and be like, whoa, you know, if he's that confused, what have I been missing? And, um, you know, I took a bit of a gap before I really started thinking about that more. And it's more been in the last 10 years. And, and what I found is you get a lot closer to knowing yourself when you're willing to feel your emotions. And now for you, you may not know the distance between those two because you've always felt it. But I can tell people for me, like when you actually feel all the emotions that you're having, you get closer to knowing yourself. And there's so much in there to use as fuel to drive yourself forward when you know kind of who you are and what you're about. Absolutely. Sadness is the key to happiness because you know what's important to you. Um, things that make you cry are important to you. And so let's focus on those. It's great. Crying is, is an indicator of what matters. Wow. Wow. Okay. So you're clearly a very aware person. Yeah. You're a driven person. Yeah. You had a purpose to that, that you recognized, maybe not so you know, verbally out loud to yourself, but you knew that you wanted to understand kind of gang culture. You knew that you you're curious about FBI policing. You were going to bring an element of the law to that. You knew that you needed to, that you felt like you wanted to prove people, you know, that you're smart and that you're capable. And so how did you get yourself out of the valley that you were in, in law school for everyone that's listening to this, whatever valley they're in? What did you do? What were some of the tactical steps you took to help yourself kind of start getting back up that next hill? What a great question, Chad. Um, and so I'm very linear, so I'm process driven also. Um, so I have a process for that as well. Um, so um, after I felt it, um, the process was to, um, to clear off my sweet Ikea desk in law school, you know, that we, you know, and clear everything off and, and get, remove the noise. And, um, Create. I created a postcard, and on that postcard, it said, um, "Today I will give 100%." So I put it up there, and it was taped on my wall in front of my in front of my little desk. And so, for me, then the challenge was defining what 100% was. What is 100% in law school? So the only way to answer that question for me was, "What do experts in this field feel like 100% is? Like, what can someone explain to me what 100% is?" So I started asking people. I started telling my professors I was on probation. I started going to students that were doing really well in law school. Students that have taken my professors and did well. And then I assessed my performance against their performance or their advice. Um, very careful not to take somebody else's path and make it my own because my path is my own path and I'm a unique thinker. And I learn very differently than I'd say like any, I don't know anyone that learns the way I do. So um, so, so then after, after, um, assessing these other paths against what I was doing, it was very clear what I was doing wrong, um, uh, or what a weakness was, we'll say, right. Cause we're not doing anything wrong. We're just learning. Right. So, um, what my weaknesses were. And then I started implementing some of the strategies that I learned and honestly, just articulating my study process was like a game changer. Oh, Here's what I was doing. That why was I doing that? You know, and then here's what I can be doing. I want to be doing that. And so um, I realized it's a big formula uh, to success. And then I just started um, trying, uh, deviating from the old path, creating the new path, implementing the new path, and assessing. And then every time I did that, you know, that that reciprocal process, I learned and I just tweaked, 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 
tried it again, assessed, and then exponentially every semester my GPA increased. I graduated with high honors, passed the California bar the first time. And let's do this. Let's do this law. You know, (laughs) that's so cool. You know, you hear, I've heard that before. There's a great exercise that people can do where you ask them like, Oh, what do you care about? You know, what do you value? And then they tell you all these things. And then you tell them like, great. So for the next week, I want you to like map your time and then come back to me with like what you did in your time. And what you find so often is that people are not spending their time doing things they care about. And it's very similar in studying. Like I look back to how I studied the way that I thought smart people were studying. And I consider them smart because they seem to be putting their hand up and getting the answers right when I didn't know it. But it made me more anxious because I didn't know how to study that way. And so I was actually doing worse because it was becoming more confusing. And so I think your, your method of using curiosity, trying to like crowdsource genius, then trying to analyze like what genius like works for you because genius is different for everyone. And it's not a commandment for your life. Like you're the only arbiter of your life, you know? So you got to like take other people's pieces of data not as this is what you need to do, but these are options for you. And it's amazing that you were able to put that together as a law student and then pass one of the toughest bars that you can pass and, you know, start taking on the law. And so, so you get out of this thing, you did the JD, were you like doing Duolingo and like doing Spanish at the same time so that you could get into the FBI or like, had you, had you said like, I'm done with proving myself to the FBI? I was all by the wayside, Chad. I never did that. <laughs> no, I didn't. Get a little Rosetta Stone out there. Who knows? There's still time. I, actually, there is. Maybe I'll start that. <laughs> you said you're not worried about the FBI anymore. You're not worried about the Spanish. You get into the area of law. You understand that you've got some of these gifts. What was driving you forward at that point? Were you still thinking about that Lisa who cared about gang culture and was curious about understanding it? Were you still trying to drive that like a, a greater equality in the industry? Or had you shifted to let's make that money? we got a big law school debt. Um, it was never about the money for me, for sure. Um, although I liked it and I made great, great, great money when I was working at my first several firms, like fantastic. Um, it's funny cause we've, you know, exceeded that now. And it's, it's interesting to me how it's, I view the money so differently, but yes. Yeah, so, um, it was, um, for me, I had fallen in love with the law along the way. And, um, because I, because I let go of all the things I was supposed to be doing and was just really authentically enjoying the law school experience, which is sick to a lot of people, um, because I was growing and that's why it was good. Um, and so, um, I had clerked for, I had made a lot of moves. Like I had gotten a federal judge clerkship that I brought to the law school initially. They were like, sorry, we don't, you're not going to be in any of our programming. And then I got out on my own and then they were like, oh, we'll welcome that. And, you know, so, and then I found this great, like this great, amazing boutique, um, personal injury law firm with these just phenomenal, we're talking like the most phenomenal attorneys I've ever witnessed and been in the presence of. And I learned from them. And so I, those first six years of the practice for me, I mean, the day within like three months, I was in the court of appeals um, on my own, standing in that big marble jungle, you know, with like the the velvet curtains and just making oral arguments, um, not even knowing the full bounds of the law because I was so green. Um, So I loved it. I really loved it. Um, And I wasn't I wasn't necessarily giving back. I I mean, we did catastrophic personal injury. So there was that element of of this person is like is completely changed. They are quadriplegic, paraplegic, fully, they're burned. They, they don't look wow. anything like they were beforehand. So, I mean, just Chad, some of the most horrific cases. Very intense. It was incredibly intense. I'll spare you a lot of the you know details, but it was things that people should never have seen or gone through in their lives. And they, they were going through. So there was a lot of, um, for me, there was a lot of just joy in helping those people feel normal again and making them feel whole and all of those things. Um, and that probably spoke to like so much of your purpose that you've always had, right? Which is like being in service of others, trying to bring people back to a place where they feel like part of something, not like othered from something. Um, and so that must have spoke to you. But like, how did you find your way through those first six years? Because You know, I know in the U.S. there's so much discussion around like the ability for people at various law schools to find the jobs that they want to find. It's very competitive when you come out of law school trying to look for jobs Um, and it can be difficult. And so, you know, for those that are listening that are trying to navigate their way in their career and whether it's law or anything else are feeling like 
people are just not going to understand what I'm about, what I can bring. How did you kind of navigate your course? I just cold called this law firm and I said, Hey, uh, you look really cool and you have a great website and I am a really hard worker. And if you are interested in someone that will turn your cases and make your law firm a better place, um, I am your woman and I will do anything and everything possible to make your clients feel love. And that's all I said, Chad. And they said, come in for an interview. And they said, we're not hiring, but come in for an interview so we can meet you. And they hired me on the spot. And, um, you know, it was, a uh, it was just the best experience because they are, they, they still are. I still go to them for, I still practice Chad and I still go to them for, um, advice like on really tricky insurance cases or in their, I mean, they're, they're insanely good. Um, but I will say um, I, it's taxing, as you well know, being general counsel and for all those years and in, in you're in legal tech. And so it really burned me out. <laughs> I was burned out after six, seven years. I was really burned out and looking for a higher purpose. I, I needed a higher purpose to feel like I could, that the spark inside of me wasn't going to go by the wayside. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love it that you just shared who you were with that firm. Like you just told them authentically what you're about, because here's the thing is that I think a lot of folks believe that like they want to create the biggest top of funnel of opportunities that they can, but really a lot of it is just noise. Like on the outsides, it's just noise. And the clearer you are about what you care about, a couple of things happen. One is you're a lot more confident because you have the clarity and like what your path is. The other thing, and this is what I think a lot of people miss is that you make it a lot easier for other people to want to help you because they don't have to do as much mental work to think like, what's Lisa about? What is she great at? What does she care about? Where's she on her journey? What's her purpose? You gave them that. And so then the answer just becomes, do we need that or do we not need that? But they know how to help you. And whether that's direct or indirect by saying like, hey, Lisa, we actually don't do that type of thing. That shouldn't have been on our website. That's confusing. Sorry. But these folks need someone. You've made it very easy. And so that's what I think is like so powerful about that approach. And so if it's in you as someone who's like not shy to reach out to somebody, if you are very clear on what you're about, you make it so much easier for people to help you. Um, and I think that your story really, really reflects that. And so when you were saying to yourself, like, I'm helping, but this is also very taxing on me, was that where you thought to yourself, like, maybe academia, maybe being a professor, maybe educating is where I want to take this next step? I thought to myself, um, how can I run a law practice and be more of myself? How can I run a law practice um, in a way that I get to exercise my own judgment and exercise, like, not always come so close to that line ethically, which, you know, which happens. I, I never crossed it once, but there were situations that were starting that I could see happening. Um, and for me, I, I am a very loyal woman. I'm a very conscientious about ethics and they mean a lot to me and kindness and, and professionalism. And so um, I knew I had to find a way to be my own boss, <laughs> but at the very same time, I was like, I also want to give back to law students who, who necessarily wouldn't have the opportunity to work for big law or work for get all, you know, go to the Ivy leagues or go to, you know, all of these positions that, or get the jobs in law school because they have low GPAs. So that started becoming something I started thinking about more. And the more I thought about it, um, I happened to get a call from a professor who, um, who I shared my whole story with on probation at Western state. That's where I went. And she said, Hey, we have this position, Available coming up, and we have a lot of applicants. Um, would you be willing to throw in your resume? And I was like, okay, well, what, what's the pay? <laughs> it was like it was like a third, <laughs> maybe like I don't know, maybe like an eighth, <laughs> you know. Um, and I said, okay. And I said um, I, I, that was a joke. I really I, I didn't ask for that initially, but I did say um, I did say um, I wonder if this is the universe telling me that there is an opportunity for me to get back to being me and 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 give students that. And so then I took the opportunity. I went back, started as like um, an assistant professor and made my way up to directing the law school's um, programming for bar takers and for academic support on, you know, incoming 1Ls, 2L skills, 3Ls, graduating, taking the bar, repeaters. And that was my game for, the, um, you know, about 12, 13 years. Wow. Wow. You know what I think is so cool is that like the outcome 
sounds amazing, right? It's like, okay, and, and it makes so much sense. But one piece there that you mentioned, that's like the input is you shared a story about a struggle that you had been through and like you were vulnerable about it. And it wasn't something where at the time you were saying like, look at how great I did this. You were like, no, look at how bad it was for me and how close I was maybe to not being able to find the way forward or making this career that I've made. And I think that that is the part that's actually the core, like the outcomes of whether you end up being like this lawyer that helps people that are in very traumatic physical, you know, scenarios, or you're helping the students, or, you know, you have the course coming out. Like for me, all of those are examples of outputs, examples of ways you deploy your ability. But the core of it though, is that you're someone who is optimistic about opportunity. You're someone who's willing to feel a lot of emotions and express them. And you're just someone who feels like you're never going to give up on the chance for people to have a more equal opportunity. Like that's the core. Last part is the, that is like, I could just hug you through here because that is who I, everyone should be equal, have equal opportunity, regardless of your background or your ethnicity or religion or your, your sexual preference or orientation, your identity, every single human, every one of us, we deserve the same. And we don't get that here. You know, we don't. And that breaks my heart. It really you does. Know, well, it's, it's an amazing mission. And so, you know, you're doing this inside an institution, which is, you know, powerful and lots of students coming in, but also kind of in a singular mode because you're, you're within inside an organization. And so was there a moment when you're saying like, I'm feeling the purpose, I've been building out the process because I know you're a process person. That's also one of your gifts. And were you like, I see how this could have like a grander impact. I was working with students. Absolutely. I was working with students and I was like, well, where, where are we teaching them how to study? How, what are we, where are we teaching them how to succeed? And everyone's like, oh, let's teach them how to write. I'm like, That's the last piece of the puzzle of my chronological brain, you know, uh, let's teach them how to analyze. Well, you can, if they don't understand the case or they don't know how to read it, or they don't know how to outline it, or they don't know how to figure out the big picture, or they don't know what topic they're in, you know? And so I just started looking at all these books and I was like, there isn't a book on point, you know, like what the, heck? and then I started going to the director at the time saying, um, her and I had, you know, we have such an amazing past. I love her. Um, one of my sisters, I feel like, and, um, I, I said, she, she's a very analytical thinker. So my chronology, we would butt heads and I'd say, you're on step 10, get me, I'm on step two. I need eight steps in between. And she'd be like, Oh, you know, she'd be like, well, I didn't explain that to the students. Yeah. That's why they're confused, you know? And so then she would explain that she would see the big picture and I'd say, Oh, I know where you're going with this. Okay. I can get students there. So it was a great, you know, synergy between her and I, I just really felt like we were letting students down in the same way that I was let down in legal education and students weren't just naturally inclined to say that, to know there was a process, to know that people would help them. And so then I didn't want to give them my, you know, my advice. I'm, you know, I'm one person. And so then I was like, I need to do a qualitative phenomenological study. The phenomenon, Chad, being what do successful law students do to thrive from the moment they get that syllabus to they take the final exam. And so I had all this data from all these students. It was a two-year study. And I, I put it up on this massive board. I'm a visual kinesthetic learner. So I eliminated all the redundancies and I was left with this very complete picture. You know, I'd saturated the market by the time I started getting the same information and no new information was coming in. I knew I was done with the study and I had the lived, complete lived experience of successful law students. And so then I eliminated those redundancies and I had this picture and I just put them into these steps. Um, I found common themes and those themes um, were kind of the, what, what jet, what made the student jump from step one to step two to nine. Um, and um, I put those together and then that's what I, I, I published, I parlayed those steps into my book. So I was like, Hey, maybe not just law students at Western state, maybe lost law students on a national level. And, and gratefully, I've been successful in nine other countries as well um, in getting out how to study, like from day one, before week one, before you start till your final exam, what do I do? And so um, the biggest piece for me when I started teaching, I started teaching out of the nine steps. I realized, Chad, <laughs> and this was kind of a hard one for me because I thought, oh, there's this great thing um, is that people are like, I'm not going to follow your process. And I'm like, it's not my, you know, like they didn't, like there was a hesitancy to be like, no, that's not going to work for me. So I really had to dig 4,000 levels deeper and say, 
how, how will students, how can I get students to receive this in a way? Cause I know it's beneficial and I know it's not my way, but how can I get them? And so then I had to go to the law student and uncover their thinking and learning preferences and teach them how to use metacognition to get through each of the steps to gain that deep understanding and succeed in law school. So adding that piece, the very first piece of the law school operating system is to, my course I teach on the nine steps is to understand how you learn new information and to customize your studying to your preferences. And that is what I feel like is one of my biggest you know, contributions to the legal education. That feels like the win because you're using like how humans naturally trust each other because humans can become, unless you're, I think, unless you're in um, like a flight or or fright mode, you're, you're resistant to being told what to do. If someone's like, Hey, there's a dinosaur coming, you better run then. Okay. You see the dinosaur, you go, you'll take that advice. But I think in so many other things, when it's not so black and white, someone telling you what to do out of the gate without you feeling like they care about me as an individual, they're curious about like how my natural ability is going to play into this. People are resistant. I think what, what you uncovered there is so smart, which is I tell this to people a lot you know, whether it's like helping like an organization or a law firm unpack their talent, which is it matters that people feel like you want to get to know them for who they are, because if they are unwilling to trust you and to absorb the information, what is the point of a good idea? A good idea that nobody is willing to use is nothing. And I would rather take incremental progress while you build trust every day of the week. Every single day of the week. And here is an example that drives that point home, Chad. I, one of my students is an NFL player. And he for the, he was like, Lisa, I cannot understand what these professors, I don't understand the way they're teaching me. And I said, um, and he kept repeating, kept repeating. I've been hit so many times in the head. I've been hit so many times in the head. All I know is my coaches tell me to do this play and I do it. So we sat down and I created um, his name, his playbook. Uh, for every single main topic with X's and O's and arrows. And I said, I want you to study this while you're on the treadmill because I know that he needs movement. I said, you need movement so that your brain is, is going to receive the information. That's the best way that you learned from you know the time you started playing professionally till now. And you're challenging yourself in a different way. So he now has the most beautiful... <laughs> play uh, uh, plays for each main topic uh, with X's and O's and those cute little arrows. I, I, he, he laughs when I say they're cute, but like I think it's like, you have to meet people. Like you said, Chad, you have to understand what makes them tick and you have to understand how will they, how, how can I best give them this information? So going back to me being able to express emotion, that helps me identify what others emotion is and what they need. Because I just ask really, like deep questions with zero remorse and it takes them off guard. Like, uh huh, you know, and then it gets them talking and opening up, which creates the connection, creates the trust. And they see that I just want to help them. And so you just hit it on, not surprisingly, chat about you hit it. On. <laughs> you know what? Um, By the way, if I haven't said that, like your brain is and your contribution to our profession is uh, absolutely you. incredible. I appreciate you. It's funny because, you know, I thought for a long time, I was always very curious about what other people are motivated by, why people connect, why they don't, what helps them find the greatness within them. I always cared about that. It's funny. Like I was a very competitive soccer player, but I'm not competitive. And I never told anyone that because I thought it would decrease my chances of like getting opportunity, but I was like the captain of the team. I was playing in the center midfield. So if you're a soccer fans, kind of like you're the engine of the team and you're helping everybody. But for me, I never really cared if we, if we won or if we lost and, you know, I played division one soccer, but for me, it was always about two things, helping people find the greatness in themselves and making the way forward easier. Well, when you do that, an output of that is that people play better. The team plays better together. And so you win. And so from outward looking in, it looks like I'm competitive, but I wasn't. And so I always restricted kind of telling people who I really was for a long time because I felt like it just wasn't going to work. But what I learned over my career is that those things that were in me that I wasn't really telling people about, they weren't my weaknesses. They were my gifts. There's lots of other things I'm not great at, but like 
quickly seeing what's great in other people and then having an ability to connect with them so that they create like clarity and confidence to bring it out for their own lives. Like it's what I've always done. It's what I deeply care about. And so it's actually feels easy to me. And I think for folks that are listening to this and you're listening to Lisa's story and you know how she always cared about kind of creating more of an equalizer is that sometimes, maybe often, the things that are your gifts, you don't even pay attention to because you think they're easy for everyone. And they're not. It it would have been really hard for me to call a law firm like you did out of the blue and just start telling them this is what I'm about. And, you know, it'd be you're great and I'm great and you should hire me. Like, that's just not something that I would be so naturally inclined to be able to do, especially at that stage. But that's your gift, right? That's one of your gifts is to like put that into the world. And so I wanted to share that with folks, because when you're listening to Lisa's story, like the takeaways that I have is that, you know, you were very fortunate to be very naturally aware of your gifts and you're always able to use them. Me, it's kind of come a little bit later in life. And no matter which way it is for you, know that you have them, know that they're unique to you. You're one of one. There's no one like you. And the deeper you tap into those things, the more successful you'll be because that is where you are differentiated. You know, you're not mirroring anyone else. And my curiosity is kicking in and I want to ask you, um, So my way of untapping people's natural greatness is to ask deep questions and to just kind of put it all out there. How do you do that for people? Because I want to know your process so that I can learn and add your process to mine and combine and and learn. I'm always learning. What is your process to uncover someone's greatness? It seems like um, it's a a broad sweeping term. Mm -hmm. I think... I am also, it does start a little bit with curiosity for me. I'm very curious about people's stories because I'm curious about what drives them. I'm curious what they're motivated by. I don't usually take what they say as a response as the answer. Like I've learned that the answer is like four things deep. And so I'll find different ways without trying to seem like I'm really going at it to ask them, oh, why was that? Like, how did you feel about this? Why was that? And I find that you actually see it in people's faces they actually light up a little bit when they actually get to the piece where it's like, I was witnessing like gang culture or people not being given the same opportunity. And like my heart broke for these people because like they didn't have maybe a family that was going to give them that. And so they had this other chosen family that was available to them. And that seemed wrong. You can actually see it in people's timber of their voice. You can hear it in the speed in which they speak. You can see it in their eyes. And so whether it's through that conversation or separate exercises, what I try to do is I let them know that I see that. And that it's valuable because a lot of people are never told what they're great at because we just assume they know because they do it all the time where you're lifting people all the time. So people feel like, what if I have to tell Lisa she's lifting people all the time? She knows this, but people need to hear it. They need to be seen. And that's what starts to unlock it. Yeah. Okay, great. So that is super helpful. So your process is to recognize, so use your gift to recognize when someone's shoulders kind of go back and that they are in their comfort zone and that they are, they are themselves and they're, they're expressing um, something that's meaningful to them. And then you can highlight for them and use that for them um, to get them closer to understand their greatness and the gifts that they can have in their career and basically in their life. I love that. That's really, really cool. Super cool. Collecting things back to people is really powerful. Like I say this to people on LinkedIn all the time. It's like everybody thinks you should go from like doing nothing on LinkedIn to like creating these posts that are going to like be the magic. What I tell people all the time is, you know what the best thing is, is just like reflect back the goodness that you see. Reflective so, listening. Yeah. Like you see Lisa's like helping these people. You see whoever's doing something great to like move an industry forward, whatever industry it is. If you just tell people the words that are actually in your mind, not jargon, not acronyms, you just say like, Hey, Lisa, like that's really impactful that you helped with these kids that way. They otherwise probably wouldn't have gotten that. That's a pretty beautiful thing that you're doing for those kids. Like people can hear it in the words. And they feel it. And I think for a long time, Chad, I'm going to just expose something. I, um, I was frustrated with people that had a hard time articulating those things. Um, I, I was so curious that I just didn't understand why can't you just talk? Why can't you just be open? Why can't we just get over this? Why, you know? And so um, the process of, of understanding human behavior and people's pasts and their experiences has been a real big eye opener for me. And it gives me this hunger to uncover the lived experiences of every aspect of someone who, who doesn't feel great inside. Like 
no, it's available to you. It's, it's there for you. Let's figure out how to get it, you know? And so that frustration is, is something that I don't talk about a lot, actually. I'm kind of realizing that in our conversation, um, you know, especially with like siblings, like we deal with things so differently. Like, I'm like, let's put it all on the table. I can't, I'm not like you. I don't have, you know, like, okay, I'll give you your space, but it's killing me because I need to talk about it now, you know, like realizing that um, your natural gifts can also be a detriment and you have to, you have to hone it. It's a craft of just being like understanding and um, everyone's so different. Yes. You're, you're spot on that your greatest asset can be your greatest weakness if you overuse it. Like I'm extremely relational. It's what drives me, but I have to be mindful of like business realities, right? Of like family realities, time commitments, because if it was up to me, I would just want to have these conversations and help people all day, but there's other pieces and you're, you're, you're very on point that it's like, you also have to take a step back and look at your own gifts and be like, how do I use these effectively for the greatest benefit of like all of my goals? Um, I think that's a, that's a great note. So you, you've built out a framework, you've done the study, you're helping everyone from, you know, one else who are pro football players and, and beyond. And now you've also, you're about to, at the time we're recording this, launch the course, which I actually think is such a great reflection of everything we've said, because you were teaching it in a way that you were teaching it and that people had to absorb it, whether it was live, whether it was in the school, but now it's actually the perfect reflection of letting people learn in the way that they fully learn in their own time scale. And so was that the model that, that drove this next piece? Absolutely. That and seeing others succeed in doing the same thing and what they offer people when they say it's self-paced, watch it at double speed. If you want, watch it at half speed. If you want, stop, pause, do the exercises. I give them, you know, an 80 page workbook full of exercises and I have very clear goals. I'm going to define the skill. I'm going to give you a chronological list of how to complete the skill. I'm going to show you tons of examples for every learning preference and thinking preference. And then I want you to try it. And then I want you to, we're going to assess it. We're going to assess your performance. And then I give them a skill scale, like a competency rubric for like, you're at the poor, you know, this is a poor attempt and this is, you know, you've mastered it and it, you know, there's competency in between and approaching and excellence in between. But um, yes, you know, it's, it's definitely like my way of saying, um, do this on your own. And, you know, um, I believe because I believe so strongly that it should be success, you know, success should be available to everyone. I'm not going to break the bank. You know, I'm still practicing. Like one of my other hungers is like running a successful law business and law practice with my husband who I met in law school. And, um, and so I'm doing that. And so it's, it's affordable. It's a, it's 199 bucks, you know, so you can, you can, use, you know, the participants of my study. And, you know, when I add my experience and expertise or you buy my books for 20 bucks or which is all, all in the, um, the successful student perspective. I don't have that. I didn't, I was very careful not to mess with the, you know, the pureness of my study and just let the students uh, guide my book. Um, so or you can call me, you can say for, you know, I, I don't want to break law students' um, banks because I remember being poor at myself in law school. And I remember feeling like the pressure of having to get jobs in law school, which I couldn't, you know, because I wanted to study. And so it's my way. That you're creating this way for people to learn on their own if they want to, because some people don't like to learn, they like to admit that they're learning to the person that's teaching them. And so if they had to book something with you separate from the financial piece, it's like, okay, well, I'm admitting that I'm learning this thing. And, you know, all these pressures are telling me that I should know. And this way they can just kind of take it and do it on their own, but still get all the benefit from it. And so I think that also like unlocks another barrier for people who just learn in a way where they're feeling too much pressure to admit that they need the support. But it, when I was in 1L, like I wish that I had access to these types of resources. Like I just, you know, kind of had to do what you did, which is like ask questions, be resourceful, map out my own way. But this is something that, you know, is just so impactful for people. So, you know, I'm so excited that you're going to launch it. Thank and you so much. as you're moving through, so you're moving through, you're helping all these people, you're now exploding it into courses, you've got the practice. What is it that, you know, you're so aware, but you've still gone on such a journey? Like, what is it that you would tell like little Lisa or Lisa going to one L or some student that's struggling right now or someone else in their career that's in a career kind of struggle moment? What would you tell them about what you've learned through your journey and how you've kind of moved out of that valley and into more peaks? 
I would say that um, every part of it is part of the, you know, everything that you go through, you know, is part of the process to where you're supposed to end up. And some people end up here, some people end up here. And, and so wherever you end up is where you're supposed to be. And so it, it doesn't matter, you know, as long as you can um, take each piece. Like I know when I was struggling to create the online course, cause it was like just every, I was like unlocking and knocking on every corner of my brain to just give the most of myself. And I was struggling and I was frustrated. And then I got the kids and I, and I, and I want to make dinner and I, and I, and I have clients and I'm right to say, damn, damn, how lucky are you? You know, like how lucky are you that your problem is that you want to do so well that you're frustrated by the lack of immediate success? What can I learn in this moment that will, um, how, how is what's happening right now um, actually good? The things that we perceive as bad are actually really, really, really good. So little Lisa, um, you're not stupid. You are enough. You are beautiful. No one can take that from you. You're going to achieve no matter what you do in this world. You will achieve exactly where you're supposed to, you know, in your 110, 15 years that, you know, my creator has given me on this planet um, before I go on to the next level and start exploding it up there, you know, like um, you're enough and you're beautiful. And I tell students that male, female, I, no matter who you are, right, them, I, 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 you are beautiful. You are so beautiful. Do you know that? you know, and then that breaks down barriers. Like, don't, I don't know that. Or why do you say that? That's weird. Well, here's the reason I say that you are, and you're, 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 you're just your existence right now in your struggle is a really beautiful thing. And you'll see that you'll see that soon. You'll know. Yeah. So you'll, I, you'll catch up. I read that in a book once about like, when you don't know something and you're kind of like asking some like greater wisdom and they're like, don't worry, you'll catch up. Like you'll know it soon enough. And um, I think that's amazing. You know, like people just must be so shocked when they hear that from you and it probably leaves a deeper impact on them than you can even appreciate. And they probably take it forward in their life and, and probably even pass it on to other people. So that's, that's an incredible impact to have. And, you know, like whether it's in your practice, whether it's with students, whether it's in the course, like, you know, you're just, you're making the space better, safer, happier, like a warmer place to be. And, you know, if there's any industry that I know needs it, it's, it's the legal industry. And so, you know, that's, that's an incredible purpose to have. And so thank you so much for, for sharing it, sharing the journey, incredibly excited for the launch of your course. I wish I had had this, you know, when I was a law student, so I'll be telling all the, all the law students I know about it, um, you know, and we'll make sure to, to get it in the, in the show notes for the launch so that people can see it and go to it so they can help them, you know, in a way that's affordable to them and doable and usable for them. And that's an incredible impact. So thank you so much, Lisa, for sharing your time on the, what you're about podcast. I, you know, I just really think that your journey is such an incredible example of uncovering your gifts, using them, even when it's hard and finding a way to create an impact that, you know, only you can make and you're doing that. So, so thank you for this. Thank you. That means a lot. I really appreciate it. It's been an honor being here. Thanks. Oh, thank you. And thank you for everyone that was listening, you know, let us know how this impacted you or questions that you had from it. And, you know, just tag Lisa and myself so that we can help you out if we can, or point you in a good direction. And if this was meant for somebody else and you happen to hear it, you know, I think it'd be beautiful if you shared it with them too. So for everyone that was listening, thank you so much and wish you an incredible day until next time. Thank you. 